Welcome once again to the Amalgamated with Christ Church, where the purpose statement remains the same, to bring people back into fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. This morning, focal scripture is Matthew 11. We read from verses 20 to 24. And I want you to pay specific attention to one word in this portion of scripture, and that is the word woe. If you look carefully, you will see where it began, where we are picking up. Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe! To you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in a day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who were exalted to heaven will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Now let's look at that in today's principle, present day principle. I say it's war to us in an unrepentant society. So war to an unrepentant society. Now I want you to look carefully as I said at the word woe. Woe does not refer to any ordinary situation. So when you hear woe, it refers to circumstances which bring forth great destitution, suffering, misery desolation or pain woe also represent a destruction woe also represent torment and gloom so therefore therefore when the scripture says woe to you you can use one of those words and interchange woe to you and most often a woe is as a result of disobedience so we say, woe to an unrepentant society who have been disobedient because the word of the Lord has come to them, but yet still man has not find it in their heart to repent. And so as I said that woe is most often as a result of disobedience. And if you look at Deuteronomy 28 and look at verse 1, it says, now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your our God to observe carefully all his commands which I command you today. The Lord that the Lord your God will set you above all the nations of the earth. And so it lists a set of blessings that goes with obedience. And if you move over to verse 15, the same Deuteronomy, it lists a set of woes that goes with disobedience. So I said, a woe is usually as a result of disobedience. Some of us may be saying that passage that you refer to in Matthew 11 and reading from verse 20 to 24 that it does not relate to us today because that was a different time. It was way back into the past. And so I'm going to say to you, you're, you're, you're never more wrong. And that's one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons there's going to be a great war. Because whatsoever was written a fourth time is not so that it can be passed away, but it's for us to learn from it. There's a saying that saying you should learn from your mistake. You do not repeat the same things twice. And, and so society today, nevertheless, they are repeating all the things that were done back then. So there's an unrepentant society. And so I'm going to say to you, you can never be more wrong by saying that that passage was back then. I'm going to say it's even more relevant today. Now you look at Romans 4, Romans 10 and verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. 
end of the law are, are, are culmination to everyone who believe. Meaning that if you repent, the law has no mastery over you. And I say to you, that's the reason this passage is more relevant to us today than back then. Because those people are no longer here. But the judgment will come anyhow. So let's focus on us today. And I say, woe to an unrepentant society. Before a great war, before any war comes along, the Lord God Almighty, because he's so merciful, he sent his prophets, he sent his preachers to go forth into the world and to proclaim the gospel, to give everyone a chance to repent. So no one can say that God is not merciful because we know that his mercy endures forever. And so you look at Isaiah 58 and look at verse 1. This is the prophet going out and listen, cry aloud. Spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgression. Today I am telling you your transgression. There is going to be a woe to the unrepentant society. Many people today are in receipt of a warning. But yet, no change. Today I say to you, woe to all unrepentant souls. Woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. Woe to you. Jesus came, Jesus was here. Go back to Matthew 11 and verse 20. Then he began to rebuke the cities. He rebuked or he denounced the cities in which most of his mighty works were done. Jesus warned us and told us that he would denounce us if we fail to follow him, fail to acknowledge him. And it's the same thing back then. Those people were in receipt of the warning. If you look at Matthew 10 and look at verse 32, it says, Therefore, whoever confesses, it means, or acknowledge me before man, I will confess before my father. Who is in heaven? But whoever denies me before, before men, I will also deny or denounce him before my father who is in heaven. So it's safe to say there is going to be a great, a great, a great, great weeping and mourning and gnashing of teeth because many people will be denounced. Doesn't matter what you are doing, where you are, if you fail to repent, you will be denounced unless... Unless, unless you decide to change your ways. Because Jesus was in the midst of, a, of what was called the evangelical triangle per history back then. Those three cities, Chorazin, Bethesda, and Capernaum, they were approximately five miles apart. And they formed what is called, uh, uh, according to history, evangelical triangle. So it's said to say Jesus was evangelizing in that area. But yet still people fail to repent. And so Jesus said, whoa. And it's so amazing that it also declared that in that, in those city, Jesus did most of his mighty works. So those people were first and to witness the mighty works of Jesus. Now the gospels, the gospels, the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They documented between 32 to 40 miracles of Jesus Christ. And it says most of his mighty works were done within those three cities. Chorazin, Chorazin I mean, Bethsaida and Capernaum. But yet still people fail to repent. Now if you search the gospels carefully I said that between 32 to 40 were documented. In the Gospels. But nevertheless, don't believe that the, all there was. Because John said it in John 21 and verse 25. That Jesus did many things. Not everything were documented. Or else you would not have books in the world to write them down. Now, let's get back to where we are. The evangelical triangle. Today, there is a great evangelizing going on. But many people fail to accept this, fail to repent. It's the same thing back then. Jesus began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done. Woe to you, Chorazin. All right. Let's look at that city, the first one. That city, according to history, was where they had a great grain harvest. So it's safe to say that that city had wealth. 
That city had status because people from all over the world back then would come there to purchase food. So they had something of substance, something that people want. Mighty works of Jesus took place right there. That same city, Chorazin bordered Capernaum. And in that particular city, there was a great, great, great miracle that Jesus did. Right there. That's the place where Jesus, Jesus had an encounter with a centurion whose servant was sick. And Jesus healed the centurion servant. So if you look at Matthew 8 and look at verses 5 to 10, you'll see the encounter between Jesus and the centurion. Now let's look at uh, Matthew 8, look at 13. I just want to give you a synopsis. Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed it, so let it be done for you. Great miracles. That's one. Now, if you look at that same city, that's where Jesus cast the demons out of a demon-possessed man. Okay? So these people were witness to all these things. Now if you look at Mark 1, if you look at Mark 1, <clears throat> Mark chapter 1, and let's go down to verse 25, it says, But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. You want it. And it's right here in the scriptures. Mighty works were done in those city, but yet still those people fail to believe. So we have touched on Chorazin, Capernaum. Now let's look at the city of Bethsaida. Now, this is the place where Jesus healed the blind man. If you go into Mark and look at Mark 8, and you see the encounter, Mark 8, 22 to 25. Now, let's look at verse 25. Then he put his hands on the eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everything clearly. Jesus did that. So these cities, Chorazin, Bethsaida and Capernaum, they saw these mighty works of Jesus, but yet still they failed to repent. Though they were in what historian called the evangelical triangle. And it's the same thing today. Many people are in close proximity to churches. Many people have churches every step of the way. Many people have churches in next door. Some people have churches in their yard. Every time you go around a corner, there's a church. But yet still, yet still, yet still, yet still, there will be a great woe because no one in those society, I should say, most people in those society, because they have some substance, they tend to drift away. They are not drawn unto the things of God. And so there is going to be a great woe because though Jesus was present back then, People failed to acknowledge him. They saw the mighty works. And so Jesus had to denounce them and pronounce a woe on them. He says, woe to you. And if you research history, you will see that those cities were eventually destroyed. Jesus made reference to two other cities, to Tyre and Sidon, and also Sodom. Why reference to Tyre and Sidon? Because those cities were where they, they call pagan worshipping. Pagan worshipping was taking place. But yet still when Jesus presented himself in those cities, the people gathered and the people came and the people listened to him. Now you go and look at Mark, the book of Mark. It's going to tell you where Jesus went and Jesus, Jesus was there. Go to Mark chapter 3. Though the, it, and it, I'm going to show you the contrast. Jesus did mighty work in one place and he went over to where it was called a Gentile city. But yet still the people came out and they, they received him. Now you look at Mark chapter 3 and you look at, at verse 7. But Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea and a great multitude from Galilee followed to him, him from Judah and Jerusalem. He read on and on and it says, And those from Tyre and Sidon a great multitude when they heard how many things he was doing came to him so Jesus was doing mighty works in three cities 
which were supposed to be exposed to the gospel because those were Jewish cities, not the gospel, exposed to the things of God. So they were supposed to have knowledge of God. But yet still they denounced the Messiah. They did not believe the Messiah. And Jesus went into pagan cities who were supposed to be lacking the knowledge of God. But because those people heard of the things that he were doing, they were drawn unto him. And they came out. And they came out. And even right then and there, Jesus had to express wonder. Because one such lady, the Syrophoenician woman, had, ex had, had so much faith that Jesus had to commend her. Now look at Matthew 15 and verse um, 28. This was the encounter where Jesus was saying, It is not good to take the children's bread and show it to little dogs. But because she was persistent and believed in Jesus, Jesus answered her in verse 28 and said, O oh woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And your daughter was e and her daughter was healed from that hour. So it's a very, it's a very striking contrast to say that he was in a place that was supposed to be knowledgeable about God. But they did not believe him. He came to them. They did not believe him. And he went somewhere where there were supposed to be people who were lacking the knowledge of God. But yet still they heard. They did not see the mighty works. They heard about the mighty works. But they were drawn unto him. And Jesus expressed wonder about the great faith. Look at the, look at the contrast. Now... Tyre and Sidon, they were eventually destroyed. You can go and you can read into the scriptures in Ezekiel 26. It details the prophecy that proclaimed that these cities would have been destroyed. And Isaiah verse 23 also detail about, I mean chapter 23, detail about the destruction of those cities. So you may be exposed to the teaching of Jesus. You may be in church. You may have knowledge of the things of God. But there is still going to come a great woe to you. Because you have been exposed. You have seen the mighty work. You have heard the gospel. But yet still there is no repentance on your part. Because most of us are still controlled by the things of the world. And because we have a little substance in our pocket, we have some food to eat, we do not think it's necessary to go and chase after Jesus. Because we're looking at today only. We're not looking at the future. We're not looking at where we will spend eternity. And that's the question. Where are you going to spend eternity? Is it because you're just living for today? Don't you, can, don't, 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 don't you want to concern yourself with what is going to come? There will be a great woe. Weeping and mourning and gnashing of teeth. Great destruction. Great desolation. And so there's going to be a time when all those unbelieving believers would want to run in. Would want to, would want to pray. Would want to jump. Would want to do everything. But too late will be their cry. Many of you who are in church today, you're still like those cities. You're still like Chorazin. You're still like Bethsaida. You're still like Capernaum. You are in the midst of everything that's going on. Seeing the mighty works. But yet still you are corrupt. Yet still you have a deceitful heart. Yet still you're breeding iniquity. And so you will be denounced by Jesus Christ. Matthew seven twenty two. Many will say to me... Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name. And done many wonders in your name. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you depart from me. You who practice lawlessness. Some translations say you worker of iniquity. Because you see, most of us, or some of us I should say, we're still sitting in church and we are workers of iniquity. Iniquity. That's a category of sin where we, when we know the truth, but we still decide to willfully go against the truth of God. We lay in our bed, the prophet Micaiah says, and plot evil. Can't wait until morning to enforce them. Can't wait to go out and to practice them. We devise new ways to do evil, the scripture says. And so there's, there's going to be a great woe to you. There's going to be a war to you. 
prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 19 says, Your own wickedness will correct you. And those of you who are in church and taking it lightly, living a frivolous lifestyle, living in a backslidden state, committing fornication, acts of homosexuality, stealing, lying, um, deceitful heart, and all the works of iniquity. It says, and your backsliding will rebuke you. It will rebuke you. And so it's going to be a great war. Look at the same prophet, Jeremiah chapter 2 and, verse, and verses 22. For though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, yet your iniquity is marked before me, say the Lord. You can pretty up sin. You can pretty up all you want to pretty it up. But your iniquity is still a stench. It's marked before God. And then you will be exposed. You will be denounced. There's going to come a great woe upon you. The gospel is being preached today. But many do not want to hear. Want to hear holiness. Do not want to hear righteousness. They want to hear the frivolous sermons. That is telling them that God has something in store for you. And it's always got to be something good. Always a blessing in store. But don't you see in Deuteronomy 28, it highlighted a list of blessings that goes with obedience and highlighted, and highlighted some curses that goes with disobedience. And so I said to you, the gospel is being preached to you today. But those of you who are exposed and you fail to acknowledge the Lord our God, it says right here, woe to you. Woe to you. Woe to you. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. And I'm going to say today's day principle, woe to wherever you are. You are in receipt of this message and you know that you're guilty. You know that your iniquity is, is going up and it's a stench to the Lord our God. And so your sin shall find you out indeed. And so Jesus had to make it clear, if Tyre and Sidon were exposed to the gospel that you are getting, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. And I say to you today, if certain people who you classify as iniquity worker heard this same message, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes, but you are getting it today. What are you going to do about it? Sackcloth and ashes, meaning they would have been, there would have been a great mourning, a great regret, a great, a great, a great pulling on and tearing down and, and Brokenness before God, meaning that there would be a radical repentance, turning away, changing. But some of us do not want to do that because sin is sweet. And we want to live our life that we call the best life now because it's sweet. Yes, it's sweet. And so we want to change the things of God to suit our narrative because we want to feel comfortable. But the scripture says right here, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows that those who are is, the Lord knows those who are is, let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. If you belong to God, you have to depart from iniquity. If you belong to God, you have to change your ways. If you belong to God, you have to set yourself apart. If you belong to God, you're going to come out from the workers of iniquity. You're not going to touch no unclean thing because you're expecting the Lord or God to take you unto himself. Money, power, respect will not get you into the kingdom of heaven. Money, Power, respect will not get you into the kingdom of heaven. It may gain you, it may grant you some favorite man. Giving to charity will not get you, into the, get you into the kingdom of heaven. It will not save you from the wrath of God. Claiming that you're a good person will not get you into heaven. Building houses for the poor will not get you into the kingdom of heaven. None of those things will not get you into the kingdom of heaven. The only thing that will get you into the kingdom of heaven is true repentance. And just like a premium, when Jesus pronounced a special woe unto them, and it had to be so, because Jesus dwell in that city. Scriptures to support that.
So before Jesus pronounced the greatest woe on them, he was living with them. And look at uh, Matthew 4 and look at 13. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea. You see that? He was there. So not only were they witnessing the great works, they lived among him. He dwelled there for a while. He stopped there for a while. So they knew him. They knew of him. They knew his work. <clears throat> So those of you who are going to church and want, wondering what would Jesus do and want some prosperity teaching, this is the same place Jesus was when Jesus said, when the scripture says, from the time Jesus began to preach and to say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So those of you who are going to church, dwelling in church and expecting something extra, Jesus says repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus was living. Jesus was there with them. The scripture says, He dwell with them. Dwell. He came and dwell in Capernaum. He dwell in the prosperous city. Dwell where things was happening. And he was evangelizing. He chose it to be his base. Today, you have churches in your community. Preachers going out on the highways and byways. People evangelizing. People preaching to you and telling you to repent, telling you about the love of God. But because of the evil and wickedness of your heart, you decide that you do not want to hear it. And so you curse God. You murder his prophets. You murder his evangelists. You murder his pastor. But there's going to come a time. There's going to be a great woe to those of you who are living in that unrepentant society. It's not going to be good for you. And just like the city of Sodom when it was destroyed, in no uncertain terms, that's what's going to happen to those of us who are living a lie in our unrepentant society. There's going to come a time when you will be severely punished. And I'm not saying that with any apology. Because there's going to be a great woe. Woe to an unrepentant society. Woe to an unrepentant society. Woe to an unrepentant society. Look at Matthew 19. I'm going to show you Sodom was destroyed. Listen, Matthew, my, I mean Genesis 19, verses um, 24. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. Then the Lord rained brimstone. And fire and Gomorrah from the Lord out of heavens. Listen to verse 25. So he overthrew those cities, all the plains, all the inhabitants of the city that grew on the ground. What am I saying? I'm saying you may be in a prosperous city, enjoying a bit of prosperity. Having food to eat, having cars to drive, having, having everything at your disposal. But yet still, you're not satisfied and so all you want is more prosperity, more prosperity. Nevertheless, that our brothers and sisters in some parts of the world, they are being persecuted for his name's sake. They are being killed for his name's sake. But you can't be satisfied. You don't go down on your knees and pray for them. You do not offer any assistance to them, and all you want is more. And if the preacher does not preach something that you want to hear, then you think that nothing is going on. And so there's going to come a time when you're going to hear, Woe to you! He began to rebuke the cities. Jesus will begin to rebuke some of us shortly. Some of you are still alive, living lavishly. And there's nothing wrong with a man being prosperous. If it's done according to the will of God, the scripture says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and everything else will be added. But some of us, we don't want to seek him, none at all. We just want a little piece of him. And that little piece must be 45 minutes maximum on a Sunday. We don't pray to him in the morning. We don't pray to him at night time. We don't seek him in no way possible. But we claim that we are his. You are not his. He will denounce you. He says, away from me, you worker of lawlessness. 
you go forth and you pretend that you have something to do with the church when you're just nothing but wolves in sheep clothing. Jesus said, therefore, whoever confesses me before man, I will confess him before my father. Those of you who believe that you're somebody, you will be denounced. So woe to an unrepentant society. Woe to those of you, just as the scripture says. Then he began to rebuke. There will come a time when Jesus will rebuke you. Go to Matthew 11, look at verses 24. And Jesus singled out Capernaum. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven. They were exalted to heaven. Jesus was living there. He dwelt there. It says, you will be brought down to Hades. For if, the, for if the mighty works which were done in you, so those of you who are sitting in church, unrepentant heart, still practicing iniquity, you're sitting in the church, sitting beside your wife, still preaching on the pulpit, but yet still you're involved in something else in the same church that you're going that's iniquity. That's evil. That has to stop. Bring in money. Getting the money from the offering plate. Doing what you want to do with it. While people are suffering in the church. That has to stop. That has to stop. Woe to you. Woe to you. Woe to you. It is just a simple warning. Woe to an unrepentant society. You do not have to like the message. But I'm just telling you what the scripture is saying. Woe to you. Woe to you. You don't have to like anything that I'm saying. Just go to the Bible. Just go to the Bible. Now, Mark, Mark chapter 1. And look at verse 14. I'm, I mean verse 15. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The gospel is not about prosperity, my brothers and sisters. The gospel is geared towards preparing you for what is to come. The gospel is here, the gospel is here for you to change your mindset, to change your ways, to seek him first so you can experience the peace that surpass all understanding once you belong to him. But you have to be willing, you have to be willing when the scripture says in Matthew 28 to go forth in all the world to make disciples of all men. He didn't have to say go forth in all the world to just preach prosperity preaching to all men. How is that going to change the way someone live? You think, you, can, you, you, you think money is going to change the moral standing of someone? Look at most of the immorality that's going on in the world today. It's because of money. It's not because people are poor. You have a lot of people that do not have millions, but they're still righteous. They're still living in peace. But once a little money come into the village or into the society, everything gets corrupt. Because people start to kill each other. People want more. People want more. People start to plot, scheme, and every evil thing. People start to do that. And so we see brothers killing brothers just for, 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 for inheritance. Sister killing sisters for inheritance. We're seeing it. We're seeing it. And so those of you who proclaim that you are of God, but you do not do his deeds, Jesus has this to say to you. Look at John 8 and verse 44. You are of your father the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. You don't want to do anything for God if you're still chasing after things of the world. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father. You want to do. You do not want to do the things of God. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. So those of you who are in church and that's what you're geared towards, you better be careful. You better be careful. It's time for you to repent. Repent before it's too late. Jesus says, woe to you. Woe to you. Woe to you. It's not too late to change your mind, you know. You still have life. There's still a chance for you to repent. You still a chance for you to repent. You still a chance to repent. 
And once you know the truth of God, the truth shall set you free. But if you do not follow after Jesus, you will not know the truth of God. You will be indoctrinated by the world. And so you will be exposed to the worldly system. And when you're entangled with the worldly system, you cannot stand for God. You cannot stand for God. And so Jesus said it clearly right here. Jesus said it clearly right here. Right here, look at John 17, 16. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So you can't say you represent Jesus, but you're of the world. You are still tangled up in the worldly system. The worldly system has nothing to do with God. It says right here, they are not of the world, meaning those who were chosen, those who were sent. And once you have repented of your sins and accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you belong to him and you were sent. And so if you were sent, you have a specific mandate. And that mandate must go to make disciples, not to go and tell man about getting rich. Leave that to the financial counselors. Leave that to them. Many preachers want to step into the pulpit now and they want to pretend like they're financial counselors. Priests spreading prosperity and so on. Most of them develop this, this, this scheme, robbing the people. And because so many of you are gullible, you fall prey to the scheme. Because you want to get very rich quickly. Very rich quickly, a get rich scheme. But the scripture does, it says right there, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. Woe to you. If you belong to Jesus Christ, if you belong to Jesus Christ, you are not of the world. If you belong to Jesus Christ, you are one with him. You are one with him. 1 Corinthians 6 and 17 says, But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. And if you are one spirit with him, you cannot practice iniquity. The scripture further goes on to say, Flee sexual immorality. You cannot belong to God and you're in church and you're engaged in illicit sexual activity. It says to flee it. You belong to God. You are no longer Honed by yourself because God has put his name on you. And since he has put his name on you, you have to live like it. You have to behave yourself just like you are a child of God. But many of us don't want to settle. We don't want to hear the truth of God. We want the next fix. We want the Bible to interpret, interpret it another way. If the Bible says the wages of sin is dead, many of you want to interject some little things in it. You start to classify what is sin. You start to break down sin. You start to have big sin and little sin. And you're going to say, well, if this sin and that sin, and you break it down, and you come up with all sorts of philosophical thoughts. But that does not matter in the grand scheme of things. It does not matter to the grand scheme of things. There's still going to be a war to you because the word of God changes not. And so because of that, many of you, you are carried off by various doctrines. Various doctrines, various preachers, various religions. Everything that comes today, you want to go with it. But the scripture says right here in Hebrews 13 and verse 9, Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrine. For it is good that the art be established by grace, not with food which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. So you see this prosperity preaching, this thing that you have been carried away, been enticed by, it's not profitable for you. Because in the grand scheme of things, you will have to give account. And so Jesus said it clearly, Woe to you! Woe to you! Woe to you! And so I'm going to say to you today, my brothers and sisters, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for those of us who are found wanted. And the reason for that, because we have been exposed to the gospel. There is no excuse. The scripture said the evidence of God is available to man. So we are without excuse. Jesus Christ came. We don't have to go through the ritual cleansing and bathing and all those stuff again. 
You can be a filthy sinner, but you will be saved by grace through faith. And you have to understand that. So there is a going to be a time when this unrepentant society that you're caught up in will have to give account. And so it's going to be woe to you who are in an unrepentant society. I say seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Seek ye first. Today you're hearing this message. Today you're hearing this message. Do not let it pass you by. Too late will be your cry. There's no repentance in the grave. So my brothers and sisters, God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.